thanks for coming along this morning. I'm, um, I know it was a tough call as to whether to uh, hit Oxford Street or um, come here. Apparently Oxford Street was an absolute zoo yesterday. And um, I gather that uh, the tills were ringing to the tune of about a billion pounds yesterday. So, uh, recession? Anyone? And the real issue about uh, today, uh, and what I hope that we've attracted here, are people that are going to build on what's already started. Because the first session with Ben and Patrick, and I've uh, asked these guys to open the, the day uh, very significantly, because both Ben and Patrick have been instrumental in actually getting the mainstream media to pick up the gauntlet on some of the stuff that they would obviously much prefer to hide. So Patrick, um, I'll talk more about his uh, 21st Century Newswire um, uh, website shortly, but Ben first came onto my radar after he did an interview with Tony Gosling. Some of you will know Tony. Um, Tony's radio show in Bristol. He does a Friday evening drive time radio show. And um, Ben, this was back in what, May, I suppose, and Ben had been working for some weeks with a company called G4S. Remember them? Well, you better get to know them because soon they're going to be, um, you're going to see their logo on the streets masquerading as policemen. But uh, Ben uh, was concerned about the level of security at the London Olympics. And it was absolutely down to Ben working with G4S and being absolutely appalled at what he saw. And he tried to approach the mainstream media with his, uh, his insights. And of course, he had a bit of a track record because he used to work with the Cook Report. So, you know, he was no uh, newcomer to investigative journalism. But funnily enough, he couldn't get any of the mainstream media to pick up the gauntlet on his insights um, whilst training with G4S. So the story broke when Tony Gosling uh, interviewed Ben. And then a few days later, Ben um, appeared, I think, on the Lou Collins radio show. And then with the UK column and more about uh, what the UK column is doing with its daily news show uh, later on um, this afternoon. And because of that, because of those interviews, the media picked it up. And then eventually, of course, the questions were asked in Parliament. And, of course, everyone claiming that they had absolutely no idea that things were in such an appalling state. Well, and I say Ben was uh, certainly the prime mover on that. And then with the recent um, focus on the paedophilia cover-up within the, the BBC, and, of course, everyone has at last you know, been able to come out of the woodwork. Anybody who tried to come out before, anybody who tried to raise the issue was vilified. And uh, Ben in association with Patrick, actually ran an item about Ben's experience with a certain uh, MP called Ken Clark. And at the time, when the, when the news item appeared, uh, Ken Clark's office, um, interestingly, uh, requested that the news item be removed and that any reference to Ken Clark be removed. And even actually suggested that um, it was probably just a case of mistaken identity. Well, Ben has uh, subsequently made or lodged a formal complaint with the police about uh, Ken Clark's behaviour. So it'll be interesting to see how much of that makes it into the mainstream media. So this morning, Ben's going to um, give us an update on uh, that and uh, share his views on what's occurring right now. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Ben Fellows. Thanks, Ian. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, I am Ben Fellows, and um, uh, up there's my website, so if you want to contact me or whatever, you can uh, just jump that down, or you can come and give me your card or something, and I, I email uh, everybody uh, all the time anyway. Um, so uh, I started out as an investigative journalist <clears throat> um, with the Cook Report. Um, I wasn't a full-time employee. I was freelance because I did the um, uh, undercover portions of their programmes. Uh, the way the format would run, basically, was that the undercover guys would go out and they would do um, preliminary research, and they'd do some uh, undercover photography of whatever the story was going to be. Um, and then 
we'd hand that over, then the producer of the programme would build the programme around what we'd got. And then obviously Roger would come in at the end and do the, the front bit and the end bit. And that's roughly how the programme kind of was put together, really. So I was there, really, as a, a young boy and uh, to, um, to basically uh, be a child actor, which is what I was. That's how I got into it. And, uh, and how I started, basically... Uh, well, that's me doing uh, G4S and, and uh, the 2012 Olympics, um, which nothing happens to me, by the way, whatsoever. Uh, everyone was saying, you know, you're going to death threats and all that kind of thing, and nothing, nothing, not, not a thing. All that happened was that G4S lost £700 million, pounds, which, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of, actually. So, uh, and, and they're going to be uh, detectives now, by the way, G4S. Um, they've got the contract to be police detectives, so, um, uh, so they're basically going to be ex-police officers who are then working for G4S is the theory, but uh, they're cheaper, obviously they, they don't cost the 60 grand or the 30 grand, whatever they, uh, the detectives now cost, uh, they're a lot cheaper, so um, I thought I'd just uh, mention that. That's me as a child actor, um, that's, the, uh, that's Ben Fellows, the, uh, that's the um, uh, 1986 model, uh, I was um, uh, extremely young, and uh, and I was uh, 11 years old there, but I, I was only about 4 foot 11. So um, I, was, I was very young and, and what have you. So that's me at the RSC playing uh, Fleance, which was my first job. And from then on, uh, I basically wanted to be an actor. That was, that's all I wanted to do. Uh, my parents couldn't stop me. They, they hated the idea of you being an actor. They were not happy about that at all. They basically wanted me just to do the thing, go to university, finish school, all that kind of stuff. But I was insistent that I wanted to be a child actor. Uh, and so the process started. And... This morning, what I'd like to talk to you about is the process of being a child actor, what that means, and then how that fits into the BBC and my article about paedophilia in the wider entertainment industry. Um, and as you'll see, as we talk about it later, paedophilia is actually used as currency uh, within the entertainment industry. And by currency, what I'm talking about is that um, if I know a piece of information about you that you don't want out there in the world, you're now completely controllable by me. It's as simple as that. So if you're having an affair with someone and, you don't, and, and perhaps you're a politician that are preaching family values, you don't want that information out there, do you? Right. I know that. You're under my control completely. Yeah? That's how it's used. Uh, and so when you see these celebrities and famous people, um, they're famous because they've been chosen for a reason. Right? And that's everybody, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah? And that's a fact. Uh, and we'll get to that in a bit and how that all uh, works in. And it, it, it's quite interesting and... Uh, well, hopefully you'll find it good. So, uh, so anyway, um, uh, that's the school I went to, Silver Young Theatre School. So after the RSC, um, uh, you might recognise uh, her there, Amy Winehouse. Yeah? Of course, now deceased. Um, but all, all those kids, uh, this is not my school photo, so I'm not in that one. Uh, my mum has it in her scrapbook, and when I said I was doing the presentation, and could I have it, she said, well, I've got to, I've got to go in the loft, I've got to get the bags out, you know, I was like, okay, forget it, which is why I only had one picture, because a friend of mine came to me, uh, an ex-girlfriend who I'd given the, uh, the photo to when I was a kid, and she emailed it back to me on Facebook. Anyway, so that's the school I went to, and so as a child actor, I basically said, look, how do I go about this? And um, Jonathan Price, who was in the show that I was doing at the RSC, said, look, you need an agent, you need to go to uh, stage school. So that's what I did, basically. I worked all over Birmingham, all over the Midlands. I did various shows. and I did world tours, went to New York, uh, worked on Broadway. You know, did, I, I worked constantly, uh, both in theatre and television. This is not my CV. This is just the thing. Uh, so um, then you need an agent. And this is Ari Gold from uh, a TV show in America. He's an agent. And what agents do is they procure people. Uh, so in my case, um, it was a child agent, and child agents procure children. That's the whole idea, right? Um, this person here is everything to an actor. Without the agent, you don't get auditions, you don't meet directors or producers, nothing happens to you. Anyone you meet that says, I'm an actor, you say, have you got an agent? They say, no. Well, eh. you might want to be an actor, but you actually have no prospects really of working or actually making a living at it. And, um, uh, and you'll notice that only very few people actually do end up making a living at it. Uh, and it's not because they're any better than anyone else. It's just they've got an agent. And usually the better the agent, the, um, the more opportunities you have. So, for example, I was with Sylvia Young, theatre school. She was the biggest agent and theatre school in London at that time. So we were all on EastEnders, we were on Grange Hill, we did various TV shows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so the agent's everything. Um, and also, agents send you out on castings, 
what these castings are, they can be called generals. And it's just about meeting and greeting someone. And uh, you get to turn up at this audition. They say, well, we haven't really got anything for you this week, Ben, but we want you to meet some producer or some director who's coming to town for a movie. And so you go, sure, yeah. And off you trot to the hotel room. And of course, you know, uh, <laughs> this is uh, the casting couch. And uh, this is what it's all about. And if you think this is a joke, it really isn't. Uh, this happens in offices. It happens in hotel suites. It happens at parties. It happens within the entertainment industry. And if you think this just happens, you know, um, at the wider industry and not, say, at the BBC, well, uh, <laughs> obviously now you'll believe it actually goes on everywhere uh, because of what's come out in, in recent weeks. Um, but I was often sent, you know, you saw how little I was. I was 4 foot 11. I was 11, 12 years old, 13, 14 as a child actor. And I, I'd be sent to people's hotel rooms. And you know what? You'd have alcohol, they'd get you drunk, and you don't want to say anything to anyone because you're doing something secret. You're doing something that your parents shouldn't know about. My parents were in Birmingham, right? Uh, uh, they had no idea what I was doing. I was at stage school. I lived with a family who was supposed to look after my well-being, um, and they didn't, <laughs> you know. And, of course, I was a kid, so I wanted to try and get away with everything that I wanted to try and get away with. Uh, but, unfortunately, what happens then is that you get sucked into a, um, a world that because you are, you are accepting of secret gifts, let's say alcohol, drugs, whatever it may be, whatever's your, your, your thing, uh, you can have whatever you want, by the way. That's the other thing. So uh, if someone says to you, um, uh, Ben, we want you to turn up for this movie or this TV series, and I say, no, not really. I don't, I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm not interested. They'll say, oh, well, look, you know, we'll, we'll give you a, you know, uh, what do you like? Well, what do you want? Well, you, we know you like to party. So therefore, you know, we'll put on a great party every night for you. And you think, oh, OK, that's all right. That's your thing. If it's a kilo of heroin, that's what you can have. Uh, and this is what they, they get you. This is why a lot of stars seem out of control, because they just get given whatever they want. Um, in the BBC, when I was there, there was uh, very no well-known um, presenters and game show hosts uh, who liked to have uh, young women. These weren't underage women. These were just young women. And uh, the BBC, uh, on taxpayers' expenses, would ship in escorts for this guy. Right? And you're paying for that with your TV licence. Right? Uh, the drugs that were consumed in dressing rooms and what have you, paid for by TV licence because you get on expenses. Right? And people don't know this. This goes on within the, the organisation. So the casting couch I had a lot of experience with. And uh, uh, this is Bette Davis. Um, she told an interesting story when she was 90 years old at a governor's uh, mansion dinner they have in Hollywood every now and again. And, uh, and basically, uh, she told a story that uh, she, uh, she was up for this uh, particular film at MGM, which she was contracted to at the time. And uh, uh, when she went for the audition, she slept with the guy on the casting couch in the office, the producer of the film. That's what he wanted to sleep with Bette Davis. So he, that's what he got. And she got the part in the movie. That's the deal, right? Uh, however, he got sacked uh, a couple of hours after um, uh, uh, she'd slept with him. Uh, for some reason, another movie had failed or something. And then word came from the head of the studio, get rid, right? So uh, they sacked him. A new guy gets put in in the afternoon. The movie's still on, but now the new guy is saying, oh, I don't know if I want Bette Davis. So guess what she did? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <coughs> chorus line. Uh, it's true, right? Uh, this is a movie. Have you seen it? Seen the show? Yeah? Well, it, it's out there. It's probably on YouTube or something, right? Um, and this is a story about uh, an audition and what you will do to get that job, right? And, uh, and, okay, it's lots of singing and dancing and, and the really great tunes and everything. But in the essence, it's I'll do anything for that job. Um, if you, and this is to get into the chorus of a show. This isn't even the main parts of the show, right? We have no idea what a chorus line is actually about other than it's about an audition, right? So you'll do anything for that. So when you have an uh, extremely famous producer standing in front of you saying, I'm going to put you in my next movie and you're going to be a big star... Now, you can think, well, everyone says that, right? It's a joke. But when that person is actually somebody and they actually do have movies out every year, suddenly it's not a joke. So it's kind of like, OK, let's begin the negotiation. And, of course, if you're a kid, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're negotiating. You're just having another glass of uh, beer or something, right? Or they're putting out the line of Coke when you've got a bit tipsy and you're downing a, a line of Coke, which was my thing. Um, I quite liked that uh, while I was a kid. Um, that's me at the BBC. And when I uh, used to go on BBC News 24 quite a lot. Uh, and, of course, <coughs> that's Jimmy Savile. Uh, it's the vile uh, creature that he is. And, um, uh, and so uh, uh, I, I wrote this article. Um, Would the BBC try and fix it? Um, uh, 
basically because of the, the way the, the board of the BBC works, right? Uh, with Chris Patton, who's, who is the, you know, the guy to get everyone out of trouble. And all he's done really is put people into trouble. Uh, so anyway, um, this goes on uh, in the industry. And I suppose the, uh, the way that I dealt with it was to be a flirt, right? That's what, that was my thing. I'd flirt with you. Right? So I'd give you everything. I'd, I can, I, I'd make you laugh. I'm a great conversationalist. I'd sit down. I would entertain you at the audition, right? which I thought was my job, uh, to be fair. You know? um, uh, whilst they sometimes took their clothes off or um, tried to put their tongues down your throat or whatever they, they were trying to do, which was usually pretty gross and disgusting, and you know, uh, you'd try and fend off. And I'm sure... Uh, most people in here <clears> have <throat> had experiences like that when you've been at nightclubs and had unwanted attention. Yeah, well, that's fine because you know you're an adult and they're an adult and you're all a bit tipsy and that's fine. What we're talking about here is children in the entertainment industry in an adult industry that shouldn't really be there in the first place. Not really, you know. Um, uh, so really, the agents are where the problem starts and the stage schools are where the problem starts. Well, I'm not casting any aspersions on stage school or agents. Um, uh, because they are procurers of children or of people, whatever, uh, that's a place to attract paedophiles. Wherever children are, that's where paedophiles are, right? Uh, the church. The Cub Scouts. You know? We don't like to think about it, uh, but that's true. Wherever you get groups of children, we see it in uh, nurseries. Penny? Children's yeah. homes. Yeah. In Wales, the children's homes. Yeah, and all over the country, we see this every time. Wherever children are, there's paedophiles. That's their thing. That's the animal instinct of a paedophile. They have to go where the children are, right? So, bearing that in mind, uh, or rather, not that slide, but uh, the casting couch one, I guess, um, you are then put into a, a, a situation where you are the prey, and they are the predator. Um, imagine sort of walking into a lion's den and crossing your fingers, hoping they don't attack you, right? <laughs> and this is the position that I put myself in. And I, I, you know, I freely admit that, right? Um, I could have walked away at any time. Um, but the trouble is, you get treated so well, it's very difficult. I wasn't sexually abused, by the way. Nothing ever happened to me. Um, what I'm, my story is one of near misses, yeah? And... Um, and uh, uh, very minor assaults, if you want to call it that. I call it groping when it gets to that level. Uh, but, you know, the police have a slightly different definition and what have you, as I found out when I went to see them about Ken Clark, or well, they came to see me, right? Um, however, we'll get to that in a bit. <clears throat> uh, so, um, uh, this is the BBC Television Centre. Uh, at this end, uh, you've got studios from, um, I think there were eight to one going that way, or one to eight going that way, if you, if you look at it that way. Um, uh, this is the, uh, the new uh, entrance here, over here, which we don't see. This is the old entrance here. Um, uh, and then the dressing rooms uh, for guests uh, were upstairs. And so, um, uh, so everyone who was appearing on top of the pops uh, or whatever shows would all have their dressing rooms on the, on the basically ground level. And the basement level was where all the celebrities had their dressing rooms. And if you worked at the BBC for any length of time, that's where you'd have your dressing room as well. And everyone shot on the same day at the BBC, right? So, for example, when I was doing a children's show at the BBC, next door to us was absolutely fabulous. The Generation Game was uh, a few studios down. Yeah? And they all shoot, uh, I think when I was there, it was a Tuesday, it was a Tuesday or Thursday. Um, so every recording at the BBC happens on a Tuesday or Thursday. So if you go and see Graham Norton... Now, you'll turn up at 11 o'clock in the morning, not at whenever it is at night, to see, to see the recording of the show, right? BBC Radio do a lot of recording on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I think that's all they do now. I'm not sure. Uh, so, uh, so my point being is that um, children, basically, are in the vicinity of grown-ups, you know, um, whilst you're making the programme, yeah? So even though it's a preschool programme I was on, um, uh, you know, it was, everyone was looking after the watershed. It, you know, you can't say chips or coke or anything like that, right? Because uh, obviously it's bad for kids, right? Uh, what you, you, you find here is that, well, in the making of it, you're in the same dressing rooms as, you know, Mick Jagger, you know, or as Roger Daltrey or whomever's on top of the pops that week and doing filming when you're doing filming. And so it's very easy for children and adults to mingle. And I don't think people have really appreciated that during the Jimmy Savile um, uh, debates, let's say, and, and discussions of what's, what's going on, is that children and adults mix all the time in the entertainment industry at social, on a social level. 
Yeah, so it doesn't matter what you're doing. Say, if you go down to Shepperton Film Studios and you're doing a commercial, you'll be rubbing shoulders with Johnny Depp, who's there doing a movie, right? So we all get that. So it's the same thing. So if you're a paedophile and uh, you're in the entertainment industry because your fame gives you access to children, and let's face it, fame gives you access to everybody. Michael Jackson got kids given to him, yeah? Most famous guy in the world. And parents just went, hey, <laughs> take my kid. Off to Neverland. Great, thank you. Excuse me, you're going where? Neverland. Uh, I think I've got a problem, actually. <laughs> you know? uh, you're not going. Uh, if it was my kid. You know? But people do. They give up responsibility to these people who they see on television or on the theatre. Why? They're just people. And in actual fact, you don't know them. Right? We don't know who these people are. Right? You don't know me. Right? You see me here today and you think, oh, maybe he's a nice chap. He, you know, and what have you, he's told a compelling yarn and I've been entertained. Right? Okay. But I could go home and beat my wife senseless. And then still come back and smile next week and go, hi, everybody, I'm back. Here's another friendly presentation. You don't know me, yeah? I don't know these celebrities. You don't know them. Just because they appear on TV, that's a persona. That's just one image, yeah? But they breathe, they go to the toilet, they swear, they do all these things that we do. And, of course, uh, they're paedophiles as well, you know? Not all. <coughs> tiny, tiny fraction. But that tiny, tiny fraction is ruining it for the great industry that the entertainment industry is. And it is a great industry. You know, um, if you go in it... Uh, it's, uh, it, you have a wonderful time, you know, as long as you're not abused, right? And a lot of people aren't abused now. <clears throat> and abuse is, is a very flexible word in the industry, because if you're an adult, then is it really abuse if someone says, well, uh, if you sleep with me, I'll give you part in my film? Mm? Nah, it's consenting adults at that point, isn't it? It's a debate, you know, that we can have. Um, should that happen? Should that conversation happen? No, of course it shouldn't. It should all be dealt with very professionally. And most things are, quite frankly. They have to be now, because people can sue people for gazillions anyway. Um, so I'm going off on a tangent again. But anyway, uh, back to um, um, uh, my story. So, um, so the agents are the, are the problem. It's where it all starts. Now, if I was a paedophile, uh, what I, I, could, I, I would basically be here is the, um, the top of the pyramid, right? It's a business structure. It works in exactly the same way as any business works, Yeah? And it works in that way for a particular reason. It's so that the paedophile is protected at the top. Here, the staff, see that as children. I didn't make this, by the way. I, I got it off the internet. I, I, I can't do uh, Photoshop and stuff like Ian does and all those people. Uh, I think it's great. Uh, so I had to get it done. And I kind of went, this will just illustrate it, right? It's a pyramid structure. That's the, the thing. So there's your children, who are the staff. Um, you've got your, your junior management. These are the stage schools. You've got your, your middle management. These are the agents. And there you go, you've got your producers, your directors, your financiers. They're your, your upper management, right? So what you don't want to have is a connection between your senior manager and your staff, do you? In any business, you don't want to have that. When I worked for Channel 4 um, uh, for a short time, Mark Thompson, who was the CEO uh, at that point, didn't want anything to do with me. Right? Yeah, there's other managers to deal with that. There's other people. I don't want to talk to you. I'll say hello and be, good morning and be pleasant and stuff like that, and, and, you, and you'll be courteous and do the same. But outside of that, I don't want to know you. Right? If, if you've got an issue with programming or anything like that, send it up the line. Right? Until it gets so important that, you know... And they do that for a reason, so they can be protected. It's a, it's a simple thing. Um, as we've seen, you know, Mark Thompson over the Jimmy Savile thing said, oh, well, I was in charge, but I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, he didn't. Didn't know anything about it. Guy's oblivious. Right? I worked with him at Channel 4. He's, he purposefully makes sure he's not involved in anything, that guy, right? Uh, for this very reason. He doesn't want to have a conversation with anybody. You know, he, he started off being um, a weather producer um, at the BBC. You know? So he's, you know, these people aren't anything special when it comes down to it. They're just people. You know, and they, you know, they rise to the top very quickly, usually because they're quite flexible in how they think about things. You know? uh, so, um, so, so there's your paedophile at the top, which is senior management. So he's protected by the middle management stage schools, the agents, people like that, you know. And so what you want to do uh, is get your stage schools and agents, and we saw this with Jim, Jimmy Savile, didn't we? He wasn't the top, I don't think. I think there's someone else up there. Um, possibly Royal, maybe. Could be, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, uh, however, he was, I think, middle management. Because then what he did, he went to his mates, his paedophile friends, who are cab drivers and gardeners and whoever else we've seen being arrested and what have you, who are the um, regular people. And uh, he got them to do his work for him. He was then famous, so then he basically got kids that came into the BBC, right? Because who's going to complain about Jimmy Savile, one of the most famous people in the country, right? When the police came to see me and said, oh, will you make a statement against Ken Clark? I said, Ken Clark is a living, uh, breathing person. You couldn't even arrest Jimmy Savile until he was dead. 
<laughs> and yet you want me to go to a cabinet minister and basically say you groped me in the room, which of course they did, because he did. But you know, that was the, uh, the discussion I had with the police, right? Um, that I didn't want to be the full guy for just some fishing expedition that they had because they wanted to get credit for something, but you know. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. So that's the, that's the structure as I see it, um, and it's very simple. It works every single time. It's guaranteed to work. So you have your, your paedophile at the top, which could be a director, a producer, or a financier. Often, for me, it was uh, producers and directors. Uh, BBC would be financing something. They were my biggest employer. Um, and so you never met the financiers. They were just there, you know, and uh, the departments, you know, had their money and what have you. It's, it's in, in filmmaking, it's different. When I make independent movies... Then I deal with finances and stuff like that. Um, even a guy last year who was uh, a wonderfully lovely gay guy grabbed me by the cheeks and said, uh, if, you, if, if I slept with him, I stayed with him over the weekend and slept with him and, and what have you, he'd give me the money for a film. And, you know, I was very poor at the time. And he, I just thought, could I do it? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> a million pounds is a lot of money to make your film with, right? So, um, so uh, you know, as an adult, uh, you know, it still even happens. So, anyway, um, uh, so you've got the, you, you paedophile, you've got your middle manager, and this is, you see, with Jimmy Savile. So he had his uh, little minions that they would, they would go off, you know, and these could be people who ran schools or, or whatever, wherever children were, wherever he could use his celebrity or whatever to do what he wanted to do. Uh, seems to be what's been talked about. And stuff like that. So, you know, I recognise this now wherever I see it, you know, in, in, in every sort of, you know, you want to call it New World Order company, you know, or activity that they do, you see this pyramid structure because that's their thing. Um, we all know her, right? Yeah? She, uh, she wanted to, um, as, a, as a young lawyer, wanted to uh, re uh, lower the age of consent, working for a, um, uh, a paedophile organisation, really, uh, basically, to 14. How about that? Fancy 14-year-olds uh, getting, uh, having sex? That's Harriet Harman. That's Harriet Harman. Yeah, MP. Um, uh, so, yeah, she wanted to, to lower the age of consent from 16 to 14. In actual fact, a lot, a lot of people have been discussing the fact that they want to get rid of the age of consent uh, at all, really, which seems to be ridiculous uh, to me. Um, and so, you know, uh, coming up to uh, the Levinson inquiry, uh, I had an interesting uh, discussion with one of the Levinson people uh, yesterday, in actual fact. Uh, so we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so what's happened, basically, to the BBC is that all this has been uncovered, right? And uh, it's collapsed the integrity of the BBC. It hasn't collapsed the BBC. The BBC's fine. It's a building. It's got people in it. People are still going to work doing their thing, right? But their integrity has been uh, damaged, and rightly so as well, because obviously people knew about what was going on with Jimmy Savile. Um, and if it was true in his day, and I'm telling you it was true in my day, you know, um, uh, and, and, and basically, is it going on today? Maybe. Maybe in a different guise, you know? What happened to me didn't, it wasn't the same thing that happened to those uh, children with Jimmy Savile. Um, I was employed by the BBC. I wasn't a guest on a show or anything like that. So uh, it was a slightly different thing. I was more into put into parties and stuff. And then who, it's who you meet because of that. That's part of the problem, and auditions and, and what have you. Um, uh, so the integrity of the BBC is really damaged a great deal uh, over this uh, because people knew, and instead of saying, you know what, uh, Jimmy Savile, there's a problem with that guy, what they did was then, oh, he's a big star. I can't really say anything, can I? Or they said something to someone, and that person said, he's a big star. What the hell do you think you're doing? Which is what people say a lot in this business. Yeah? You never eat lunch in this town again? Yeah, happens all the time. I've been told it in one way or another, loads of times. I'm still here, I'm still doing my thing, and you know, and what have you. Uh, so, um, people can always get out in the police station and make a report to the police, couldn't they? All these BBC staff that are pleading, I didn't know anything, right? Well, if you're suspicious, if you're that suspicious to be concerned about it, and you remember it 30 years, 40 years after the fact, surely you could have gone out to the police station and just said, look, I just want to put it on the record. I don't want anything to come of it necessarily, but at least it's on the record, right? No one did, you know? So whilst all the BBC are kind of, you know, um, plucking at the heartstrings, saying, oh, it's all terrible, you know, our reputation's down the toilet. Well, the reputation should be down the toilet. It's a despicable thing that they've uh, allowed to fester uh, in the organisation. And it is festering, and it is there. And if you don't weed it out completely, what is a great institution, it is a great institution, um, when I was at the BBC, outside of everything that I've talked about, uh, they were basically, it was the best place to work in the world, really, you know. Uh, you know, when everything was fair and right and, and, and good with the world, jobs you did there, it was great. You had wonderful opportunities at the BBC. You'd 
BBC Radio. I would never have done radio uh, had I not have been at the BBC uh, doing radio and having worked on BBC Radio 2, you know, did all sorts of educational programmes and stuff. It's a great opportunity existed. Now I'm not so sure. Um, uh, uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, one of the countries that if you don't have a free press, this is kind of what we're going to be, really. Uh, we're on our way to being, yeah? Um, and, of course, you know, that's uh, Nazi Germany. And then I, I decided to, uh, to put a list of other countries up who also don't have a free press, because that's what Levinson's about. It's about not having a free press anymore. It isn't actually about uh, phone hacking, yeah? Phone hacking has been dealt with by the police. And um, a, a journalist friend of mine actually broke phone hacking. And um, uh, basically, uh, those people who were the initiators of it, uh, who actually did it, Went to prison two years before it even broke in on Channel 4 on the, uh, with Andy Davis on the mainstream. Yeah? They'd already been caught, and this guy had been to prison, some private detective. Right? Suddenly it breaks. Suddenly you get all these celebrities and what have you coming in. And it's a despicable thing. Right? But it's very, it was easily cured. All you had to do was put a PIN number into your phone. So any celebrity, from when it broke, then complained you know, six months later. Well, they could have just put a new PIN number in their phone. Simple. Or not have a phone. I don't even have a mobile phone. It doesn't happen to me. Right? Newspapers were told that they couldn't really report on news anymore, on politics. You can't really question the government and the powers that be. But what you can do is you can report on celebrities. It's going to be wall-to-wall -wall celebrity. And I saw it change, and I think you've probably all seen it change as well. You know, from news to important opinion, you know, uh, to suddenly it's all about the important opinion of Paris Hilton's handbag. What's that about? It's a handbag! It's a 400 quid handbag. You're an idiot if you buy that, right? <laughs> it's a 400 quid handbag. What's a handbag? Just something nice to put stuff in. <laughs> you know? It's like me having a thousand pound wallet. What for? It's in the back pocket. No one sees it. I pull it out. I show off at the counter. Well, who cares, right? So Levinson really is about the government getting control of the press. And that's it, right? Um, uh, everybody has been arrested who's in the police are going through their files. Uh, Murdochs have been shredding like crazy and they're going to get away with it because they were always going to get away with it. And they're really the perpetrators. And also they said to their journalists uh, in their organisation, you can't belong to a union. Why can't you belong to a union if you work for the Murdochs? Well, because if you have a problem, you'll get told to do something unethical. You go to your union and uh, uh, you say, hey, look, I've got a problem with my employer. And your union takes up your case. Well, Murdoch's didn't want that. So you couldn't belong to the NUJ, right? Or the BAJ, the British Association of Journalism, who I'm with. Um, so you can belong to anybody. And so these things, people had nowhere to turn. Journalists had nowhere to turn to. So before we all sort of start, start saying journalists are bad and they're corrupt and this and that, yeah, of course, yeah, there are people there that are corrupt. Like people are corrupt in the police. People are corrupt in every daily life. You know, it's, it's the nature of who we are, I think. Um, uh, but they had nowhere to turn. They had to do it. Although they said to lose their job. And we all know what losing your job means in London, you know? It's, 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 it's pretty horrific, you know? So people are going to um, do their best, uh, I suppose, to, to keep their jobs. And so um, uh, before we start ragging on the journos, they have been arrested. Yeah, Rebecca Brooks is, uh, I think, going to be, she may even go to jail, you know? We might be, you know, lucky uh, in a way, you know? I doubt it, but it might happen, right? You know. Um, uh, so that's what that's about. So all the people have been caught. Why do we need suddenly new laws, new institutions set up to handle the press? Right? Why? Everyone's been caught. Everyone got dealt with. It took a while for it to come out. I grant you, but things do. Right? And when it came out, it really came out. So why do we need Levinson inquiry? Yeah, we have a little inquiry. We'll, we'll, we'll decide this is where all the bodies were buried. Right? This is what happened. But outside of that, why do we need new laws a new institution says that we don't, do we? Otherwise, we're going to turn into lots of Germany, you know? And, uh, and like I said, I put these lists of all these countries, and I've forgotten, which, <laughs> I've forgotten who the countries are myself now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, uh, who's, who, anyone, anyone know who this is? <laughs> this is my new, uh, my new game. Um, <laughs> this is, this is uh, my wife did it for me, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> this is Burma, right? Or one of the flags of Burma. Uh, and then you've got uh, the USSR, you know, don't have a free press, right? Pravda, remember Pravda, right? You see it, you know, it's in Doctor Strange Love. They say, you know, we've got the biggest bomb in the world, we're going to blow up everything, give yourself a nuclear weapon. And they said, yeah, yeah, but it's only scary if everyone knows about it. Because goes, ah, yeah, we're going to put it in Pravda on Monday, but, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Pravda. Um, the Romanian uh, uh, Republic under uh, Ceausescu, 
Uh, again, didn't have a free press. Uh, Republic of China doesn't have one. Uh, Iraq under Saddam Hussein didn't have one. Uh, Cuba uh, didn't have one. Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, uh, which is there with a nice little sun symbol. And, of course, now, if the Leatherson uh, report gets implemented in full, you won't have a free press. Oh, but that's okay, though, right? What does that mean? It doesn't really mean anything. Right? It just means that you get more of Paris Hilton, you'll get more of celebrities, you get more of Big Brother. Oh, it's not even on now, is it? That's why I didn't watch TV. Or whatever it is, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. But what you won't get is you won't get news. Not real news. You won't really know that Flora is killing you, <laughs> causing you brain damage. <laughs> They'll go, it's good for your teeth. <laughs> Hell, you know, uh, these people are, are crazy. So that brings me on to, um, to basically Ken Gate, right? Who I'm, I'm trying to, this is not sailing at the moment, but it will do. Um, uh, I've I, I put it out to a, a few, uh, to a few um, uh, uh, mainstream media people and stuff like that. So Ken Gate. Um, uh, so, so basically, I had a, a, a phone call yesterday from someone um, who was a Leveson advisor, and they checked out and they were a Leveson advisor, and they basically. Look, what's been happening with Levinson reports since the report came out is that you've seen TV attacks, you've seen the press attacks, you've seen now radio attacks with what happened with uh, Kate Middleton in hospital, where the, a prankster in Australia uh, on a radio station, which happens all the time. Remember they did it here with, I think it was John Coleshaw and Tony Blair or something like that, and he called it and pretended to be William Hague and got through, right? So it happens all the time. Uh, what the people don't do then is go and kill themselves right, for putting a phone call through. So again, they've closed down that part of the conversation, haven't we? We can't now discuss this because someone's dead, you know? So, effectively, they've attacked radio as well. So now, uh, they're going to be looking for the internet. And so, uh, when I made my allegations against Ken Clark in an article uh, on the 21st Century Wire, Patrick Henningsen's uh, uh, web wire, um, <coughs> I thought I'd get sued, like, instantly, right? And nothing happened, right? Nothing happened at all. And yesterday, I found out why. And um, this very nice person from the Levinson Inquiry basically told me that you and Patrick and the other bloggers that put up your posts and what have you are going to be the poster children for the censorship of the internet in this country for the same reason as the, you know, the Australian pranksters are the poster children for radio, right, broadcasting. And my mouth was hung open. <laughs> I went, do <"Duh." laughs> You know? And, uh, and I said, yeah, that's basically what's going to happen to you. And I said, so why are you telling me? He said, I'm giving you five minutes warning because I like you. <laughs> and that was it. Apparently, we'd met at a party once, and I was nice. I am nice. That's the thing. You know, I'm not worried. So, so what's Kengate? Well, Kengate was when I was working for the Cook Report. Uh, and I was a child actor. And a family friend came to me who worked at the Central Television and said, look, Ben, uh, are you busy? And I went, no. He said, do you want to do a, a nice little job? And I said, OK, fine. What is it? And he goes, I can't say. It's all very cloak and dagger. Right? It's for the cook report. Right? I was like, yeah. It's like James Bond sort of stuff. Great. I got whisked in the car down to London. And I was abducted by Central TV for a number of weeks while we, we shot this thing. So I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, uh, and so uh, um, and there's Roger, uh, as we know for the Cook Report. Uh, that's the article. Uh, we used the same picture again because I didn't have one. Um, uh, this is when it uh, appeared in the Express. So we got into mainstream media, uh, which was really cool, which was, which was great. Uh, that happened uh, at the Olympics as well. But they replaced me with an actor. <laughs> so, you know, some white actor they put in a hat and thing and said he was the undercover guy. Uh, but he was saying basically what I, what I had said. So. Uh, so to be actually on the front of uh, the Express newspaper is actually a really good thing, and uh, you know them acknowledging my existence and what have you. So uh, uh, that's um, uh, me and my wife Julia, and this is the letter that the Cabinet Office sent to Patrick Henningsen of uh, the 21st Century Wire. Um, nothing was sent to me. This was just sent to him, and it basically says that the comments are defamatory. Uh, blah blah blah. It was mistaken identity, as Ian said earlier. You know, maybe he didn't understand it was. Ian Greer stood there in his office and said, "Ben Fellows, well, Ben Worrell, Ken Clark." Right, because Warrell was my stage name for the job. Right, so when someone says Kenneth Clark MP, hey, it's not mistaken identity. That's who you get introduced to, unless there's two. Right, I'll give you that. If there's two Kenneth Clark MPs, then maybe, maybe, you know, I doubt it. So, uh, so that's the letter they sent, and they said we're going to sue you if you don't pull this down. And I said, well, you know what, Patrick, that's a request. Don't do anything. And uh, I published the letter, um, which they didn't like, but that's what I do. I don't keep secrets. I publish things. Right? So uh, if you come to attack me, then um, I'll, I'll tell the world about it. You know? So um, the, uh, the police came over to see me once I, I'd said this. And what happened was basically I was in uh, uh, Ian Greer. Ian Greer was uh, a political lobbyist. I was in his office. Kenneth Clark was in there. I was there to deliver a letter to Ian Greer about a project we were working on the Cook Report, basically saying our dodgy company was going to hire you. 
right? And pay him lots of money. So he was in, you know, so it was a good letter for him to get. Uh, Ken Clark was in the office. I was introduced to him. Why he was there, I have no idea. Maybe he was there to meet me. Maybe not. Uh, while I was in there, I got groped by him. Now, I'm not going to go into too much more detail because I've given a, a statement to the police and there's an investigation going on. But broadly speaking, that's basically what happened. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, but the police came to see me at my house. Uh, I didn't call them. They just rocked up. Uh, I did the uh, express interview. And the police said, look, we want you, want you to tell us what you told the express. I said, OK, fine, not a problem. You know, the press can't have the names that I mentioned and the police not. I mean, that would be ridiculous, right? So I said, so I told my story. I gave them all the names that I'd, 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 who had basically um, uh, been uh, you know, inappropriate with me as a child actor because uh, I was saying it was the wider industry. And, of course, about Kenneth Clark, which that, they, were all, they were only there for Kenneth Clark, really. They weren't interested in anyone else. They said, look, we suggest that you make a statement. And I said, why? And they said, because in six months' time, you won't be able to do it, and then it will be impossible for you to get out of the corner that you're now in. I went, well, I mean, I had agreed to make the statement already, right? So I didn't need to be cajoled or bullied or slightly talked to. And I was like, well, and now I know what he meant. He was, it was a warning. He was, it wasn't a threat or, or whatever. It was just a, it wasn't any kind of pushing you in the direction. It was a warning. And the warning was that something was going to happen to the internet within the next six months, because they knew what was going to happen. Because of what the Levinson inquiry had already done. And phone hacking, they could see that it was going to damage the police as well. This is not just about the press, but attack on the police. Scotland Yard's been sold off, by the way. Do we know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Scotland Yard's been sold to a private company. Right? The actual building. So, uh, so the police know what's going on. They know they're being attacked. It's, it's, a, it's a cold war that's going on, clearly. Um, and so the police said, look, you're in a corner. And I went, what corner? I said, exactly, you don't even see it. But when it comes down on you, it'll be like a ton of bricks. So I said, OK, fine. Uh, um, but they wouldn't explain it to me. And they left just like that. I thought, OK. And then another officer came and did the statement, and that was that. Um, and it was only until that phone call yesterday that I realised that they knew they were going to try and censor the internet. And because my story had appeared on the internet first, before it appeared anywhere else, um, uh, they were going to basically say to me, look, this guy um, is causing gossip on the internet. He's the reason why we have... And he's just trying to smear a cabinet minister, right? A senior cabinet minister. Probably one of the most senior cabinet ministers. Ken Clark has been there through everything, right? Um, and so had I not made a statement to the police, now with what's coming down with Levinson and that phone call yesterday... It, like they said, it would be too late to do it in the future. Because as soon as they come out and say, oi, that's it, you're done, I, which Levinson did to the radio people, right? That blew up, and they didn't know what hit them, right? They were in a corner, they didn't know it, right? They'd put themselves in a corner because they did prank phone calls, right? So um, I was in a corner, and so basically, I was being warned. Do something about it. Now, because I've made the allegations to the police, and the statement has been written, it exists, I'm now a protected witness, it is now an ongoing police investigation. Um, uh, and so that brings us up to, to where we are today, um, which is it's still crackling on. We're still getting stories out there. We're uh, in the mainstream more and more now, which is really great. Um, it was a surprise to me that I was, found myself out of the mainstream and then I'm you know, finding myself and going back in in other ways and stuff. So um, uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, what I've had to say. Uh, I hope you find it useful and stuff like that. And uh, thanks for listening. And we'll uh, continue uh, the saga. And if you want to catch up, that's my website. I do a little radio show. So uh, check that out and stuff like that. It'll be really cool. And, uh, and, and thanks ever so much. And I'll see you soon. Take care.